Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna do a little PC archeology, span taking a look at these two HP Vectra computers. One's a 386, one's a 486, and I kind of like them because they are basically pizza box form factors, which I really have a soft spot in my heart for. Back in the day when I was working on computers, the PCs I worked on were always uh, test top tower cases and things like that. They weren't highly integrated like these HPs are. Therefore, you get the size advantage of having a small machine like this. So what I wanna do in today's video is find out if these make good retro gaming PCs. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, as I mentioned in the intro, I have two of these computers and they basically look identical, except one is a 3620 and one is a 46, well, 25, at least according to the label. I did a little research and I looked up and the 3620N, which is this top one here, came out around 1991. And you'll notice that it's only got a three and a half inch disk drive, which happens to be 1.44 megabytes. This was right around the era where IBM PC compatible computers started getting rid of having a five and a quarter inch disk drive. Although at the time when I was working on PCs around this era, I worked in a computer store in high school, we still pretty much exclusively built computers with both a three and a half inch and a 1.2 meg five and a quarter inch disk drive. Since these machines appear at least externally to be pretty much identical, I'm gonna move the 46 down and we're gonna look at just the 3D6 machine first. So the HP Vectra 3D6 20N. 1991, this machine came out, and I would say that very much it's kind of aimed at the same market as the original IBM PS2 machines, like the Model 30, although this has a 3D6 SX, and I'm not sure the Model 30 ever had a 3D6 in it, but I'm sure later IBM PS2s did. I'm not too familiar with the PS2 line, but I am pretty sure that IBM sort of started making these really slim line pizza box form factors, which were really advantageous for an office environment where you just didn't have a lot of desk space. I'd say that this computer is pretty handsome looking. I mean, it's entirely a plastic case, at least on the outside, but it's actually quite heavy. So clearly there's a lot of metal going on on the inside. From a size perspective, it is 15 inches wide by 15 and a half inches deep. And height-wise, it is just four inches tall. So definitely on the compact size. That means that if we flip this around to the back, it's going to have slots that are sideways. And it does indeed, because there's just not enough room in a low profile case like this to have vertical slots. Now I haven't done any testing on these computers or even looked inside for that matter. So I don't really know what we're gonna find, but I have a feeling we're gonna look inside of this thing and find a very integrated motherboard. And it's kind of given away by the fact that it has a bunch of ports here. So it's got PS2 mouse and keyboard, parallel port, two serial ports, and a VGA port. And then it has three presumably ISA slots, which has a network card installed and I guess a SCSI card. Here's the label for the 386N. There's nothing too unusual here, multi-voltage power supply, but I did notice that it says made in France, which I think is a little bit unusual. It's not common you found European manufactured computers here in the United States. On the side of the machine, there's actually a physical lock here, which I read the manual says that it locks the case. So you can't easily pop the cover off because the case design is such that it has these plastic tabs, which I think are pretty easy to pop the cover off. So on the front of the machine, you'll notice that it has various buttons and well, what looks like a fake button, but that is actually just an indicator for the hard drive LED, which is right here. There is a recessed reset button right here, which is uh, you have to push with your fingertip, but there's the power switch. And the reason why I think the power supply is custom on this is this power switch is very, very well, let's shall I say, this has gotta be a low voltage power switch. I, I really don't think 120 volts or 240 volts is passing through a switch that is so easy to move like this, which means that the power supply must have like a soft turn on capability, sort of like ATX power supplies uh, ended up having. There's also this button right here with an LED above it. And when you look at it, you're probably like, what the heck could that be? Well, I did look it up in the manual and this button is the key lock switch. So you set yourself a password in the BIOS. And when you push that, it locks your keyboard and your mouse. And the only way to start using them again is to type in the password that you set in the BIOS. We'll have to test that. 
Otherwise, not much going on in the front of this machine. It's just relatively handsome. And I think that would look good on anyone's desk if you're trying to do some retro computing, retro gaming, things like that. Alrighty, let's try to get the lid off this thing. So it's got these two things here to grip. And I'm not sure if the case slides forwards. Let's see, how does this open exactly? It's starting to move. I'm gonna say that this slides forward. There we go. Okay, you just have to use your fingers a little bit. Let's turn this and I will slide this off. Okay, it stops about that far and it must lift off. There we go. Now the top is plastic on the outside. But on the inside, of course, it's got this metal here for our RF uh, shielding. And luckily we can see that this computer is in really good shape. There's the key lock, which is not locked. Obviously, if you got one that is, you're gonna have to try to pick that lock or damage that lock to get it off. So right off the bat, let's see, I'm noticing that it has an external battery here. One of these lithium jobbies, which is Velcroed on and luckily has not leaked because of course, a lot of 3D6 machines have been destroyed because of leaky NICAD batteries. This is a non-rechargeable battery, so while it's possible this battery could leak, just says a computer clock battery, in fact, 4.5 volts alkaline. So you could easily just replace this with three AA batteries. Um, these still can leak because, you know, batteries leak, right? Duracells, things like that. So do be careful if you're buying one of these to make sure you ask them to open it up. Check right here on the power supply. The battery's either been removed or hasn't leaked. Okay, as I suspected, a highly integrated motherboard. So it looks like there's a connector right here which connects to this riser board, which does indeed have, at least I can see, two 16-bit ISA slots. There's a SCSI controller card with, with no floppy drive connector installed in here. There are eight memory slots in here, and they are the metal clip SIM sockets, at least on this 1991 machine, which means they're robust and reliable. The computer only supports a maximum of 16 megabytes of RAM, and that's because it has a 386SX processor, which is right here. Basically, that's like a 286 on steroids, and it only does support a total of 16 megs of RAM. If you want to have 16 megabytes, though, you have to install four megabyte SIMs, and you can only install four of them, and the other four have to be empty. The manual does talk about that. It's actually a really good manual. So yeah, you can read about that in there if you have one of these machines. There's more good news on this machine because there's actually this jumper, or sorry, dip switch block here, and the motherboard is even labeled. So there's MIRQ for the mouse IRQ, VIRQ for the video IRQ, VGA enable switch, so that's switch three, which allows you to disable the onboard VGA on this thing, which appears to be this chip right here, Heartland, I think. This is almost certainly the VGA card in this section. There's the video memory here. There's an expansion connector for VGA. And I think that's the main controller. It's kind of mediocre. So if you want to install a better ISA card, you can just disable the VGA right here and then replace the card. That's pretty excellent, actually. Then there's a password, a config, and a secure dip switch, which I don't remember what they do. I think it's stuff like erases the BIOS settings, one of them, another one uh, resets the password. This is the connection here to this front panel. And just as I suspected, that power switch is not 120 volts or 240 volts. Look, this just slides right off very easily here. That is just connected simply with a ribbon cable. So clearly that is a digital signal or whatever, and the motherboard is able to turn on the power supply. The bad part is that if the power supply is bad on this computer, and let's turn this around to take a look at that. If this power supply is bad, well, you're either gonna have to try to repair it, um, but it doesn't seem like there's probably an easy way to swap out a normal AT power supply, one of the, the later AT supplies. At least it's made by Delta here, which is a very reliable brand, and knowing HP, they would have designed this power supply to be robust and very good quality. All right, then over here we have the floppy drive. This appears to be an Epson SMD 300. Looks completely standard, so there would be no issue installing another replacement drive if this one were bad, other than trying to match the faceplate, of course, which is kind of that like darker beige. Then there's an IDE hard drive mounted underneath the floppy drive in the second bay. So if you want to have a hard drive in this machine, you cannot have two floppy drives. But it totally looks like, yeah, it looks like there's some rails that you need to have to mount the hard drive. So if your machine doesn't have a hard drive, you may have trouble actually mounting anything inside this case. It's the riser card in the middle of this computer where the floppy drive connects to and the front panel and also the IDE drive. Relatively nice uh, cable management as well from HP. They did a good job there. And I think it is just standard IDE. 
Looks like the hard drive looks to be a quantum drive just by the look of it. If we look at this power supply connector here, this is definitely completely non-standard with the ground wires over here towards the back of the machine. It's possible you could adapt an ATX power supply to actually work with this thing. And there is plenty of length available. In fact, notice there are some uh, brackets here, or sliders for the ISA cards. So I think full length ISA cards should absolutely work in this machine. Now I have to say overall, I am absolutely shocked at how perfectly clean the inside of this machine is. I find it hard to believe that it's not used, but perhaps it was used in a very clean environment like an office with good air filtration. So even though it has age on it, it basically looks like it's brand new on the inside. I'm just taking a close look at the motherboard there and it does say made in Hong Kong. There is room for a math coprocessor for your 36SX, which is sitting right there. And remember, I have that little plug-in module, which will upgrade that to a 46 SLC, I think. But part of the problem is it sits right under where the cards are here. And I think that accelerator thing that plugs in might actually conflict with the cards. Pretty lame on their part. I guess I never thought anyone would upgrade it. If they had just put the processor like over here, it would have cleared any of these cards and would not have been an issue. The battery connector is right here on the back plane. And just for anyone who wants to see the way the battery connects, because it doesn't seem to be labeled, but it is a keyed connector. There, I connected the original battery. The red wire or positive goes towards the front of the computer and the black wire is on the other pin on the opposite side and goes towards the back of the computer. So, so I think that's all there is to say about this thing. Let's test it out and see if it even works. Okay, here we go. Oh, look at that. It's working, hard drive is spun up. We got a picture, it was green. <laughs> the only error it finds so far is date and time incorrect. Okay, right off the bat, I'm noticing here, listen. You hear that? There's actually a key click, which is kind of amusing because this keyboard, of course, is, you know, rubber dome and kind of junky. So I suppose in the era of the Model M keyboard with a loud clicky keyboard, that HP added a key click into the software <laughs> to emulate the clickiness of your keyboard. Okay, so let me just set up a date here. Uh, I don't know how far ahead I can go. Uh, looks like it has no problem going at least uh, to 2022. All right, next up is the hard drive. And look at that, it's actually detecting this as 52 megabytes. I wasn't really aware of BIOSes in early 90s having auto detection, but maybe that was right around that time when that started to happen. There is a setting for the ID interface here, and it looks like you can actually change that between controller board and built in. But the floppy drive, it does allow us to set it to none, five and a quarter inch, two different types, and only three and a half inch, 1.44 megabyte. Interesting, the BIOS supports that when clearly there's no room inside this case or it provisions for an external floppy drive. But I know that HP sold other versions of the Vectra around this time that were larger and they did have a five and a quarter inch disk drive in them. So I'm assuming they were probably using the same BIOS. Looks like you can also switch the floppy drive to controller or built-in. Okay, next up are security features. This is the user password, this is ambid password, network server mode. I can't remember what that does exactly. I think that kind of disables uh, your keyboard, even when you power on the machine until you enter that password. It looks like even for 1991, there's relatively fancy settings here. Like you can actually write protect your disk drive. The flexible disk is a three and a half inch disk drive. That's pretty cool. I don't remember seeing that on other machines in this time period. Looks like you can enable disable the disk drive and the hard drive, and you can also disable or enable booting from either of them. It also appears the BIOS gives you control of enabling or disabling your serial ports. Now you can't change the IRQ or the base IO, but at least you can turn them off in here, which I guess allows you to use an external card if you so desire. There's also a setting here to change the processor speed. So automatic or high, I did see there's some utilities for this, which I couldn't get my hands on, that allow you to control things like a bunch of VGA settings from DOS, but also things like the key click and the processor speed. You can slow it all the way down to eight megahertz in DOS. It says here that it has a memory cache, which I think is a little unusual. 386SX does not have a built-in cache. So maybe there is some built-in cache memory on here. We'll figure that out by doing a little testing uh, from a diagnostic perspective. Here's an interesting setting for the refresh rate on VGA. It looks like you can set it for either 60 Hertz or an ergonomic 72 Hertz on both 800 by 600 and 640 by 480. I can't say I've ever seen that either. Um, 
not something that will just take over and override DOS applications. Theoretically, if we set 640 by 480 to 72 hertz, even running Windows 3.1 without a video driver, just the standard 16 color VGA, theoretically might be outputting 72 hertz. That's kind of cool. And that's it, that's the end of the BIOS here for the Vectra. So let's hit uh, save and exit, which is F3, and let's reboot this thing. Hard drive lights flashing. Oh, it's actually booting. How cool. So it's loading an ASPI manager. This is for the SCSI card here. So it's going to attach to any SCSI devices that might be connected to this machine, like external hard drives or CD-ROM drives, things like that. It's running the Windows net start command, which implies that this has Windows for workgroups. And there it is. Good old Microsoft Windows 311. It's interesting how long that took to load. I'm actually going to cut out some of that. Oh, and it's trying to connect to a network of share or something like that. It's telling me the network adapter is not working, but um, well, anyways. No domain server was found. Ooh, such old school days. I guess this was used with Windows NT, <laughs> domain controllers and things. Let's see what we have on this machine. So here under the program manager about pages, it says the product is licensed to DB, whatever DB is. I should have hooked up a mouse because I'm having to remember how to navigate Windows 3.1 with a keyboard. All right, just checking the control panel. Nothing looks out of the ordinary here. It's just the standard Windows stuff. But you can see here that it's trying to connect to a domain called DB. There's an application group here under Program Manager that has QBasic, SmartMon, whatever that is. Looks like a backup command and DOS editor. Let's check out what SmartMon is. Ah, this is just a Microsoft utility for monitoring your DOS 6, which is what's on the hard drive here, uh, hard drive caching. I noticed minimize there was the print manager, which has HP LaserJet 2D drivers on here with no jobs. And this is the network program group. There's absolutely nothing unusual in here. There's an adapt deck program group here for that SCSI cart that's in there. And there's a CD player right there. <laughs> Under games, we have just the usual two games that came with regular Windows. There's a group called QEMM and in there is MTT, which I don't know what that is. Let's run that and see. Manifest by Quarterdeck. This seems to be just simply a hardware information program. Like, what was this computer used for? There's no software on here. Was <laughs> this just like, like installed and never actually turned on? Is that why it's so clean on the inside? I just picked the adapter option in there and the screen is sort of freaking out now and the computer is freezing. I, I no longer hear the keyboard click. So that doesn't work. Well, since I have to reboot, I took the opportunity to plug in this HP PS2 mouse. Maybe this is period correct for this computer. I don't know. Well, even though the mouse is connected, there appears to be no mouse driver and Windows is not even detecting it. So that's it. We've gone through all the windows in the program manager here and um, there's nothing interesting. It's just that stuff that we saw. Let's run the file manager or let's drop out to DOS actually and then poke around on the hard drive. All right, so taking a look at the hard drive here, notice all the files are from 1997. So that kind of implies that whatever was on this machine, it was re-imaged at some point, if that was done by a company or someone reinstalled the OS anyways, and erased all the data that was on here. There's a folder there called A drive. Let's take a look at what that is. Uh, Lotus 21 disk, whatever that is, disk image, I guess. This is the QEMM directory, and it does appear that, that this is actually QEMM that's on here. So that's like a memory manager that was sort of popular before EMM 3D6 was. All right, what I think I'm gonna do next is boot up Memtest. Now, you have to use an older version if you're gonna use it on 3D6s like this, but Memtest 2.0 seems to work on everything. I'm gonna boot this thing up. First, we'll find out if the floppy drive works, and then I wanna see if this RAM and the machine is reliable, and then we will test some DOS games on here. Uh, just for grins, I am testing the voltage on the battery with my multimeter, and it's four volts. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I'm assuming someone had changed this at some point. I don't see how else it's possible that this could still be working. But I'm going to plug this back in the computer, at least temporarily here. So there it is, Memtest 86 version 2. I'm just going to let this run for hours, because i got to go make dinner anyways. Okay, the Vectra has been running Memtest now for, well, I probably stopped around 5.30 p.m. It's now 10.55, so it's been running quite a long time. But as you can see, well, it says it's at 107%, but it's completed a full pass and it's working on the second one. So 
I'm gonna say that this machine is working and it's kind of cool. It's so old and yet totally stable with no crashing. So I think what I wanna do now is before we do some fun stuff on this machine, I think it's time to grab the 486 and test that out, see if it also works and as, is as clean as this on the inside. Here's the 46 machine and I forgot to turn on my wireless mic so I'm doing a voiceover here. So the front of the machine basically is identical to the other one. The only difference is someone attached the keys for the case to the front. Back of the machine is pretty much the same. There's a SCSI card again, except it has a large 50 pin connector and there's a network card. The port layout is identical otherwise. It does say that it's actually made in Singapore, unlike the other one. With the cover removed, we can see right away that it has a different CPU than the other one. This has got a 46 DX266 overdrive processor installed in the slot. You can see the 46SX processor soldered onto the motherboard. I'm not sure if this is actually an overdrive processor or just a normal 46 DX266. Certain computers like that compact Presario 425 I looked at before had the ability to use normal processors and not just the special overdrive processors that Intel made. The whole fan situation is pretty amusing. It's plugged into the motherboard right here and I guess it needed extra cooling. This motherboard has an upgraded video card compared to the other one, S3 processor, along with some expandable memory. It looks like it has 512K built in and these zip or zip sockets for adding extra RAM. This machine has three 16-bit ISA slots and you can see the top one or actually the middle one is occupied by this SCSI card, which has one single IC on it and everything else is missing. The motherboard offers three 72 pin SIM sockets so you can install one at a time for probably a maximum of 32 megabytes or 48 megabytes of RAM. And like the other motherboard, there are dip switch configuration settings which are pretty much identical except it has a couple to do with CPU speed um, that I can't quite figure out, but it's probably explained in the manual. The power supply on this machine looks very similar to the other one, it's made by Delta as well. Really it's a very similar machine and it looks like a lot of parts are interchangeable. It's definitely dustier on the inside, so it definitely implies that this machine was actually used. I have the power supply connected, let's power it on. So it looks like it has a multicolor LED, which is kind of cool, and I noticed later that it changes to red if there's any kind of errors in the CMOS. The machine fired right up and started posting. The difference between the 386 and the 46 BIOS is very little. It just appears to have this diagnostic screen that kind of tells you what it's doing as it posts. All right, time to boot this machine up and yeah, it's actually booting. It's got Windows 95 on it. We're at the desktop and I forgot to plug the mouse in so I'm navigating by keyboard. Looks like this actually has the S3 video driver installed because it's running at 640 by 480 at 256 colors. Just like on the other machine though, there's basically nothing installed on this computer except for a base install of Windows 95, absolutely nothing. And we can poke around on the hard drive and it's basically the same thing. There's just nothing here. Looks like the computer was used up until about 2001 though, at least according to the dates that are on the hard drive. All right, time to reboot this machine and load up Memtest 86 so we can just make sure that it works as well. And by the way, who remembers this shutdown screen from Windows 95? If you have an ETX system, it would turn off. But if you had an AT system, this is what you got. Memtest has been running on the 486 and there are absolutely no problems with this machine. It seems to be operating flawlessly. The next thing I'd like to do is run some benchmarks on both this machine and on the 386. I wanna figure out if there's any kind of caching going on on this 486, which I have a feeling there is none, especially because it was a 486SX originally and a lot like that compact Presario without cache memory, even when you install a faster processor like a DX266 like that's in here, you don't get the full performance of that chip compared to 486 boards that have onboard static RAM cache memory. Now, on the other hand, does it really matter if you're just trying to run some old games if you don't have top, top tier performance? Probably not. Now you may have noticed I already removed the cards that were in this machine and that's because I wanna get ready to use this, which is my XT IDE card. I always use this card when I need to transfer files on and off a machine like this that has an internal hard drive because this just generally works and it's really easy to boot up off an alternative operating system and then you can copy files on and off the hard drive very easily. In fact, my intent is to just erase the internal hard drive and I have a bunch of software on these two SD cards or compact flash cards here, which I will copy onto this hard drive and I'm gonna do the same on the 386. All right, I formatted the hard drive, installed DOS 622 on there and copied over a bunch of my utilities, some games and a couple other things onto it. 
first thing I want to do is check out the CPU identification utility just to check that it is a 66 megahertz 46 and it's running in the correct speed and it definitely is and it does say that the internal cache is enabled in write through mode. So all 46 chips do have some internal cache memory which is one of the reasons why there's such a big speed improvement over the 386 but it's possible for the motherboard to have external cache as I mentioned earlier which I'm pretty sure this thing does not have. In my utility directory that I have on all my uh, various compact flashcards and retro computers, I have cache check. And what this does is it validates exactly how much cache memory is contained on the computer. And there we go, after a few minutes, the output is clear that the cache memory on this computer is simply eight kilobytes. The processor is able to read and write from the cache memory at 66 megabytes a second. Incidentally, that's exactly the clock speed, right? but it can only access the main memory on this computer at 26 megabytes per second. So it's quite a lot slower. The next thing I wanna check is how fast is this onboard S3 video card that's on this motherboard. What this program does is it goes through every video mode that's supported and it tests to see how quickly the CPU can transfer data in and out of the video memory. Remember that typically a VGA card is on an ISA slot, at least on a 486, which means it's running at eight megahertz and there's wait states involved when a fast CPU tries to talk to the frame buffer that's on the card. And I found through testing with this program that there's a lot of variance from one card to another. Some are so much faster than others, even on the same slow eight megahertz bus. There must be a lot of optimizations or other things that go on on the card that allow it to work a lot faster than others. So the command line we're gonna run is vid speed asterisk and plus. And what that does is it tests the normal RAM speed, so how fast the CPU can transfer in and out of RAM, and then also all of the valid video modes. For comparison, I took a fast video card, which is a Sang ET4000 ISA card, and this is on one of my 286 boards. And you'll notice here it's getting about 6,000 bytes per millisecond. Now remember that the 286 was where the ISA bus came from and pretty much the ISA bus runs at 286 speeds, even on a faster computer. So you're not really gonna get better performance on a faster machine from an ISA card than I think you can get on a 286. Now I tested a bunch of video cards with this program and there's a big variance from one to another, even on the identical machine, with a lot of cards being quite a bit slower than this. In fact, some cards, like I have an old ATI card, it's literally one sixth the speed on almost every one of these tests compared to this card. That has a dramatic effect on programs that try to do scrolling and things like that, which requires a lot of updating to memory. So it's really advantageous if you're stuck with ISA to use a fast card. Maybe I should make another video on testing all my different ISA cards to rank them by speed so people can know which are the faster cards and maybe certain machines are slightly faster than others with a particular card, because I did notice a little bit of variance from one machine to another even with the same cards. Well, when you run the old Landmark Speedtest 600, notice down here the characters per millisecond, well, it's slightly faster at 6,700, but it generally coincides with what the card reports in vid speed with what you're gonna get here. So that's just an interesting little side note. And what are the results for the card that's in here? Mm, some results are good, some results are bad. Notice here that the speed of the 600 by 400 and 250 colors is a dismal 1K per millisecond, but then the 320 by 200 by 256 colors is almost 12K per millisecond, twice the speed of that Seng card. The EGA modes are a little bit slower than the Seng card, but the text modes are, are twice as fast or more than twice as fast than the Seng card. The fact is, if you're playing VGA DOS games, they're gonna be in 320 by 200 by 256 colors. So the one that matters the most is that one there. And this card actually performs pretty well. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that either it's hooked up through a 32-bit bus to the CPU directly, or it's hooked up through a 16-bit bus, but it's running at a higher speed, or maybe it has less weight states than normal, because a good number of those results are faster than the same card, which unfortunately I can't find right now. So we can't put it in here to test out to see how fast it is. But just know that the internal video on here is not terrible. And just for the final test, I'm gonna run Landmark Speed Test. So there it is, we're getting 314 megahertz equivalent speed and 12,000 characters per millisecond, which totally matches what vid speed was getting for 80 by 25 text mode. I fired up Top Dench here and it's getting a score around 170, 171, 
which seems to be similar to a compact DX266. Most likely that compact machine also has no cache memory, which is why it fits in exactly there from a performance standpoint. One last little tidbit. I went to the HP Museum website and I found what I thought were the software for this 46 machine here to control the CPU speed and the key click from DOS. And that's what I downloaded to this directory here. In the readme here, it says X mode allows you to temporarily change the speed of your computer and change the cache memory and the keyboard click. Unfortunately, when I run the X mode though, it says that it does not support this computer. And I think it's because this is for the U series of machines. This is an N machine. If anyone knows where to get those utilities for the N machines, definitely let me know. Could be useful for playing certain old games that would run too quickly on a 46DX266 and would benefit from either disabling the cache in DOS and or slowing down the CPU. I'm lucky to have a bunch of DOS machines already in the basement here that have configured for gaming and stuff like that. So I don't really need this machine to be configured for gaming as such. But if I were gonna do that, I'd wanna put in something like this, a Sound Blaster 16, and something like this, which is a compact flash to IDE adapter. And it's the kind that goes in the slot cover. That way, this installed in the back here would allow me to easily switch out compact flash cards to load software on and off this machine. Just for fun, I'll install this so we can hear it playing some music. Do remember that if you're using a compact flash adapter like this and you're not using an extra ROM in the machine, like an XT IDE ROM, it's a good chance that this BIOS will only see about 504 megabytes of that card, which is a limitation of these older BIOSes. But it's not a problem if you have a two gig or a four gig card, it'll still work. It just will only see 504 megabytes. Okay, I've loaded up Cubic Player and I think I copied some mod files onto here. Here's one here. Now a 46 is relatively slow when it comes to playing multi-channel mods. Um, in fact, it's struggling here a little bit. I'm gonna escape out of there because it wasn't playing properly. So one trick is if you're using Cubic Player, you can change the mixer from the floating point mixer to the integer mixer. A 46 chip is much faster at integer math than floating point math. To do that, you go to the at symbol here on the file selector, go under devices, and then pick this mixer here. This one here is the floating point one. You wanna pick that one, which is the fastest one from a performance standpoint on these older CPUs. Quality probably suffers a little bit, but I don't think you'd really ever hear the difference. Let's try this same XM file again, see if it stutters. Right away, we can see the animation is much faster on screen here um, with this mixer. I have a 64 channel impulse tracker mod. There's no way it's gonna be able to play this though. Even a Pentium 133 struggles with this one. Okay, so far it's actually working, but it's gonna get a lot more complicated in a second. There it goes. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that, that definitely can't do it. Like I said, even a Pentium struggles with that one. Color me impressed. 24 channels is working. Let's just try one game really quickly. I'm gonna try Pinball Dreams, which is actually from 95, 96. So it's newer than this machine. But I think with a 46 DX266, it should still work perfectly. This is a direct port of the Amiga game and it offers on, on the PC, really nice 60 frames per second scrolling. What's cool as well is it uses mod music directly from the Amiga, so it has the exact same sound as the Amiga does. Let's uh, see about this here. It does use some weird custom video modes. Some LCD monitors might struggle with it. Keep in mind, actually, it runs at 70 hertz refresh rate, so you're watching this at 60 hertz, which means the scrolling might be a little juddery, because, of course, that's how I'm capturing videos at 60, not 70. It goes without saying that games like Prince of Persia will work perfectly. This is the VGA version of it and it does have ad-lib sound. The system requirements of a game like this are pretty low. Let's just give Doom a try. I did uh, run Cute Mouse and the mouse was detected on the PS2 port. So that should work. Doom runs pretty well on a 4060X266. Quake, on the other hand, not so much. All right, when I say it runs pretty well, it's, um, 
acting up. Okay, there appears to be an issue. The mouse is kind of moving everything around really wildly. So I don't think the mouse is working properly. With cute mouse running, oh indeed, yeah, the mouse pointer is just kind of going all wild around the screen. Is that this mouse that's not working? Um, I don't know. I ran cute mouse again and it says resident part reset. Let's try edit here. Okay, that's actually completely fine now. Weird, so it's like Doom itself was causing an issue on the PS2 port. Okay, I'm back in Doom in here and it I can move through the menus all right. Okay, the key click is kind of annoying because it's causing uh, clicking noise out of the machine when I hold down the key on the keyboard to move forward. I'm using WASD here with Doom. Uh, oh, the things are fine now. I don't know what was happening there. But the frame rate, as you can see, is, well, not super great. It's also a little bit dark, and I'm not sure why that is. Now, remember, Doom has a fixed frame rate, I think, of 35 frames per second, and I don't think it ever goes faster, no matter how much faster your computer is. But as you can see, it definitely is working. Okay, so I think I've shown that this is a pretty good machine for DOS gaming, at least in the 486, 386 era. It can fit full-length ISA cards, so you're never going to have a problem using long sound cards in here, like a Gravis Ultrasound or something like that. You can disable the onboard VGA if you do want to replace the VGA with an ISA card, but the onboard VGA is actually pretty good, decent speed. And you can also disable the IDE interface and the floppy interface on the motherboard, so you could use a multi-IO card, maybe like a Promise card, if you want to more easily use large cards. But I have a feeling that's going to hurt performance, because those interfaces are probably also hooked up to the CPU directly and benefit from not having to go through the slow ISA bus. I didn't really talk much about the memory. It has 28 megabytes in this one, but the fact that 72 pin SIM sockets means it's pretty easy to upgrade the memory. The lack of CD-ROM does eliminate some of that multimedia CD stuff that was just starting to happen with 486s. But ultimately I feel like if you're really wanting to do a lot of that multimedia PC stuff, you should probably get a Pentium. Okay, so let's swap back to the 386 and just run a couple performance tests on that thing and see how fast it actually is. Because the original ad I found for that machine tried to make a claim that that was a much faster 386 SX machine than typical. And the only way I could see that happening is there's some kind of cache memory on it, which the BIOS alluded to. So let's test that. We got the 386 SX on the bench here. I stuck my XT IDE in there for easy ease of use, that is. It's a 50 meg hard drive, not a lot of space. One thing I did do is I set up the password, the user password in the BIOS, just to test out this keyboard lock button. And indeed, when you push it, it just blanks out the screen. And when you push enter, for instance, nothing happens. Now I set the password as just Adrian, type Adrian, hit enter, and it comes back. That's a pretty cool feature that in 1991, I hadn't seen that on many computers, not at least ones that I worked on. All right, let's start with CPU ID. So it's a 20 megahertz 386 SX. Now there's no CPU ID command on these old 386s, so really it can't really tell other than the fact that it thinks it's a 386. Let's check out cache check and see if there's any cache memory at all on this machine. Well, the results are pretty clear here. It does say that this machine does not seem to have any cache, although it says right here that the cache is enabled. So I don't know what's up with that, but I think these results are pretty typical for a 386SX at 20 megahertz. Well, here we are on top bench. The result is a score of 50 which is unusual because there's a Socket 7 DOS machine with all caches off that it seems to be matching, which is an AMD K6. But then it lists a Cyrix 46 and a Cyrix 46 as similar results as well, which would be weird because this machine shouldn't be that fast. Remember, we got a score of 50, and here's a machine with a score of 49, which is a 46 or a 386DX at 20 megahertz, an actual DX machine and it was getting a score of 49. Here's an SX25 with a score of 47. Here's the machine that it said this one was a little bit faster than a Cyrix 46 class machine at 33 megahertz. How exactly is this machine faster or as fast as that? So this thing really is weirdly fast. I'm kind of confused by that. Good old landmark speed test six here. Let's see what this thing gets. So we're getting a 30 megahertz result. Now, um, I don't have any other SX20 machines to compare to, so I can't really say. It does say the video is Cyrix Logic, even though it looks like it's a Heartland chip there. And notice the video speed is 3,200 characters per millisecond, relatively slow. I think that saying ET4000 card in this machine would actually give a performance boost for the video, almost twice of what it's getting here. From a gaming perspective, a 3.6 SX machine is not the best. 
it occupies a kind of weird space where it's a bit too fast for some really old games and it's a little bit too slow well it's a lot too slow for a lot of other games i think games like wing commander would probably work nicely on this machine but you could also get a pentium machine like i had mentioned and use the set mole utility to turn off the caches to actually run wing commander on a pentium that worked perfectly as well let's try running pinball fantasy which is another amiga ported pinball game it does support the sound blaster 16. i'm going to set the sound mixing to medium to give this machine a little bit more of a chance to actually run this game properly. So there it is. The audio quality doesn't sound so great because I put the quality level down a little bit. There it is, Pinball Fantasies, another great Amiga port of a fun game. On a 486 at least, I've never tried on a machine this slow, it has perfect 60 or what, 70 frame per second scrolling. It looks really, really cool. Ah, uh, the scrolling is, not bad. I, I look, when the little marquee thing does stuff, it seems to stutter a little bit, but if that's not doing anything, it's now scrolling nice and smoothly. Okay, yeah, the scrolling is not great. It's not terrible. Oh, there's a lot of delay on the video capture, so it makes playing pinball a little bit harder because of the uh, reaction time. Yeah, okay, anyways. Why don't I try Cubic Player? Uh, this doesn't even appear to be working. Oh yeah, it's running. It's just really, really slow. I'm going to switch this over to the integer mixer. Let's start with an easy four channel module. This would be just like a typical Amiga module. Space debris. Yep, it's struggling. It's definitely making sound, but it's stuttering. Now keep in mind that Cubic Player is not optimized to run on a 3D6, and there are mod players that are. Is that this one is basically doing like 16-bit mixing, and it's designed for faster machines than this thing. I booted into Windows 3D6, and just for completeness, let's push the keyboard lock thing, and it actually works there. <laughs> That's so awesome. I type in the password, hit enter, and there it is, it unlocks. I gotta say, that's kind of fun. That just makes me feel giddy. Not that there's any realistic use for that at this point, but that's kind of cool for back in the day. When you have the password set like this, when you boot the computer up, it actually makes you type the password in to boot the computer. And the fact that it's got a physical key lock on it means that if you lock your computer, it prevents someone from just going in there and then flipping those jumpers or those dip switches on the board to clear your password. So they'd have to like forcibly open the computer to do that, which means this is actually a pretty decent way to lock your computer when you don't want someone else accessing your files. I would imagine back in the day, there were many people that would have loved this functionality to keep people from snooping in their personal files. Incidentally, this is the keys from the 486 and it does not work in the 3D6 cover. So there's actually a difference. Actually, take a look at that, Lyon, France. There's actually a number there, 3112. That's obviously, uh, you could get new keys made if you had to. There's the bidding for anyone who cares. I guess it's not the safest thing in the world because 3112 is written on the side of the lock cylinder. So if you lost your keys, <laughs> you could at least get a new one made. That's awesome. One thing I noticed also, which is a little bit interesting, is that the top covers, while they look identical, they don't appear to actually be interchangeable. The 3D6 case cover is actually in better shape than the one from the 486 due to some yellowing that the 486 has. So I was going to swap the badges and actually put this top cover on the other machine, but it does not fit. It actually goes down onto the chassis, but when you try to slide it back, it catches on something. So there we go. There's the 486 machine. I put an actual VGA monitor on it. 3D6 machine sitting on the side. Look how handsome these machines look. They're really quite nice. All right. I did an outro while I was trying to play pinball fantasies here on the 486. It was not going well. So I was rambling way too much. So what do I think about these computers? I really, really like them actually. They're very, very well made. Did you notice that the motherboards have no electrolytic caps on them? So they're not gonna leak and destroy the boards like on all those Macintoshes from the 90s and the Commodore Amigas from the same time period. The battery is off to the side as well. So it might cause some damage inside the power supply and also discolor some of the metal, but the PCB is on the opposite side of the case. So hopefully it'll be safe if that little battery does leak. So if you come across one of these HP Vectras and you're thinking about picking it up for some DOS gaming, yeah, it's not a bad choice. And as I mentioned before, the biggest negative is the lack of five and a quarter inch drive bay. So there's no disk drive capability and no CD-ROM capability. 
If you're okay with that, these are great options. So I hope you found this video interesting on these two HP Vectras. And if you did, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Comment down below if you feel like it. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Check out my second channel if you haven't already. There is merch available down below. There's a link down below for that as well. I will try to find the utilities that I have shown off on this video, like the vid speed and some of those other ones, and put links down below on where to download those. Problem is I've accumulated those utilities for many years now. So some of that stuff is just hard to find and I have no idea where, where it is. If I look around and I can't find it, I'll stick it up on my GitHub or somewhere else. And I think that is gonna be that. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. You can become a patron if you wanna get early access to videos. There's a link down below for that as well. And yeah, it's, that's how it goes. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.